Good evening everyone, time for another member update. So we're going to start out with the Bitcoin chart here. This is Bitfinex and you can see the price on Bitfinex is 945. We've got a price of 930 on Bitstamp. We have a price of 966 on the Russian exchange and uh, the Chinese exchange is 941. Now this is just in the last week is the first time we've seen the Russian exchange be higher than the other exchanges. I don't know what that signifies. At one point it was $100 higher, but now they're starting to sync up with each other as the market rolls over. Uh, this formation here where we had the spike top and crash down uh, and then shoulder coming in seemed to indicate to me that we were going to go lower. How much lower are we going to go? Well, here's the trend lines. You can see uh, the primary trend line gives us a price of about 700 The secondary trend line starting here gives us a price of about 800 or so. So 700 to 800 before the move is over based on the trend line. Now based on the MACD you can see that for the period of time that we're looking at which stretches back to late 2015 uh, we are already at the most oversold that we've been on the MACD down here. You can see at about a negative 24, negative 25. Now you can see that the bottom line here on the MACD is starting to turn up. It's starting to roll positive. Uh, it's still falling, but it's starting to do that sort of turn. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't go lower. There's a lot of cases. For example, if you look at the chart right here, uh, it looked like it was going to cross over. It touched and turned lower, so it can turn lower. But this sign here from the MACD is a positive. The sign from the uh, breakdown here definitely uh, is bearish. Uh, it's still a bearish formation. We're looking for a large volume spike and uh, some kind of test of one of these trend lines before we get a bottom. So let's jump over to the stock market. Now this is going to be key to what we're going to be talking about here with infrastructure. But uh, the reason why I drew in these arrows here and trend lines on the stock market you can see this is the monthly chart of the Dow 30 and it goes back to 1970 roughly and you can see that what I'm trying to show drawing these lines in is that uh, this is the nature of of bull markets overbought bull markets um, the way that they work is that they move at an accelerated pace and then they crash and the reason why is because uh, if you think about it a good analogy is a I think about an airplane going into a stall so you can accelerate upwards in an airplane and uh, get to where you're doing a near vertical climb but at some point you're going the amount of fuel that you have forcing you upward is going to be overcome by the steepness of how fast you're rising and if you push it too far what happens is you go into a stall and when you go into a stall that means that you come to a stop the plane flips and turns and goes straight down the same thing happens in markets when a market begins to accelerate upward too quickly then the only alternative is is to continue up at an extended an accelerated pace or it's going to turn around. So you can see that when we go back to starting with 1980 and this was really the beginning of money printing if you think about it because in 1980 that's when we had the uh, the inflation had to be tamed by the Federal Reserve and Paul Volcker coming in and raising interest rates up to nearly 20 percent and then Reagan came into office and what happened was we got a switch from uh, the Federal Reserve money being uh, totally controlled by the Federal Reserve and in interest rates and uh, we went into deficit spending so uh, the deficit spending that we started in the 1980s began an acceleration in the stock market and as we've continued the acceleration of deficit spending we've continued the acceleration in the stock market. So you can see that the 1980s ended in this peak from 1987. The slope of it is not that steep relative to what we have now. 
and we had the crash in 1987. Then we had the bottom. This was with the plunge protection team and Alan Greenspan coming in and uh, a lot of people have talked about how we had the working group on financial markets and government intervention in the stock market and we got this long rally that went all the way to the end of the dot-com boom and uh, a steeper slope here and then uh, the dot-com crash. Then we had the lowering of interest rates all the way down to 1% and another rally starting in about 2002, 911, etc. And that ran all the way up into the 2008 crash. And then we had a, a drop down to lower uh, lows than we had in the last one. And then we have a, a steeper rise up to about 2015 where the market stalled. And now with the election of Trump, we've got this accelerated rise. So this rise to continue the pattern is either going to have to rapidly move up thousands of points, something like 30,000 on the Dow, or it's going to turn down. And uh, if, if it turns down here, it's probably going to be the big one because that breaks the pattern. Uh, traditionally, it's gone much, much higher based on the the past moves so if this turns down at this point here for example if we get a penetration of this 15,000 price on the downside that could be the big one the big hundred year type bear market so now the question is is what is the administration going to do there the fed is kind of in a box the trump administration is kind of in a box uh, they've got a cap on the uh, debt that they're going to have to deal with but at the same time they have to spend a lot of money one to get things rev back up again under a new president and two uh, to deal with this infrastructure problem and I want to show you uh, this is a article on Zero Hedge how bad this infrastructure situation is and it's very interesting when you dig down here so this is an infographic uh, a number of of charts and pictures about the state of America's, America's infrastructure. Now we know it's really bad and I'm going to try to make a connection here between the moral uh, fiber of the society and the quality of its infrastructure because I think that ultimately that's going to be the what determines whether or not infrastructure is going to work or not is if we have uh, a high moral fiber of the people who are who are in charge of it and I'll explain that in a bit here but let's go into the article here every year Americans spend a combined 600,000 years stuck in traffic and visual capitalist Jeff Desjardins notes if you're thinking that time could be spent a little bit more productively you're not the only one in fact even politicians are taking notice of aging and infrastructure insufficient infrastructure in the United States. Recently, President Trump has started mapping out his $1 trillion plan to rebuild the country's roads, bridges, and airports, and it's worth mentioning that infrastructure spending was also a key component in Bernie Sanders' platform as well. A look at America's infrastructure. Today's infographic from High Tide Technologies and it dives into the infrastructure situation in the United States, including a comparison of federal and state spending and uh, so here's the infographic and uh, but uh, you can see here's one that's talking about st the states how they compare the the dark uh, is the worst and you can see that's right here on the eastern seaboard and uh, then the best is seems to be in the midwest now the the thing i really wanted to look at here and concentrate on is this breakdown of states so you can see they're ranked based on the 2016 infrastructure rank and uh, then there's the previous year uh, with the state and federal investment so you can see here are the states that come out on top uh, number one Indiana two Texas then we've got Tennessee Georgia Minnesota North Dakota Ohio Kansas Missouri Florida Nevada, Wyoming, Utah, Kentucky, New Mexico, so uh, Illinois. For the most part, if you look at the top states here, it's your, mainly your flyover states or your red states, your Republican states. And then if we look at the worst states here, we go down to the very bottom of the list, uh, you can see 
Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, West Virginia, Washington, and then here's some outliers, Alaska and Oregon. Uh, but it seems to be a fairly consistent pattern here that you see uh, the highest states seem to, in infrastructure ranking seem to be these flyover states, the conservative red states, and the worst states are the blue states, the liberal states, as they say, the left coast or the coasts, and a little bit in the south. So why is that? What what would be the explanation for that? You would initially you would think intuitively it would be the opposite, because we tend to think that liberals or socialists or people on the left want to have the government uh, spend more money, they want to tax the rich, they want to have a more equal society, etc. So how do you account for this? Well, the way I account for it is the moral fabric of the society. So one of the problems that you have, if you look at, for example, Africa, where a tremendous number of billions of dollars have been poured in in aid into many of the countries in Africa and a lot of that is has been for has been specifically uh, earmarked for infrastructure but we know that a lot of that infrastructure or even most or even all of that infrastructure doesn't get built we know that the Chinese have been building quite a bit of infrastructure uh, roads for their mines, they have to have them. They have to be able to get the raw materials in and out uh, it, from their mining operations. But if you're talking about the West's aid to Africa, then pretty much you have graft, where the leaders of the countries siphon off the monies and put it in their own bank accounts, whether that's Swiss bank accounts or bank accounts anywhere in the world, uh, stockpiles of gold or whatever. So the money that's spent for infrastructure doesn't go for infrastructure. That's the way it works in Africa. Now, I'm proposing that we probably have the same sort of situation in America. The big problem going forward, if we have any spending on infrastructure or serious rebuilding of things, is going to be how to keep the corrupt people from stealing the money. Because the way it works is that Joe Blow politician has his cousin who is running a a uh, union shop or a, uh, a construction shop that does whatever work they're looking at, they feed the money into related uh, businesses that they have an interest in. It's called self-dealing, it's corruption, and so they can get kickbacks on that. And what happens is the graft and the corruption ends up sucking all the money out so uh, the infrastructure never gets built or whatever gets built is very, very poor quality and uh, most of the money ends up being stolen. So it's very interesting to me that we see that sort of a pattern. The only way I can explain this is that the left, who really, honestly, uh, the, although they have a very, very high standard of morals, it's a very twisted standard of morals, they uh, have a very strict... Uh, uh, religion of diversity, tolerance, etc. But when it comes to things like right and wrong and honesty, uh, they tend to be godless. They don't believe in the absolutes. So it's not surprising to see that type of corruption. And you can see that it's right on the eastern seaboard and it's on the left coast. So that's just kind of an anecdotal thing that I noticed there. Uh, this is going to be the big problem going forward. Yes, we need to rebuild our infrastructure, but are we honest enough to do so? Uh, are we just going to throw money at private industry? That seems to be what Trump is proposing. Uh, and how's that going to work? So how does that tie back into the markets? Well, we're kind of at a critical juncture here with the stock market where uh, we're running into a steeper parabolic slope here and we're at the beginning of a move that really should at least do probably as much as this move did uh, percentage wise or maybe twice as much or maybe three quarters it, it's going to be larger than what we have here so 
with that being the case, we're going to see pretty quick uh, a potential hyperinflation with money flying into the stock market. Or if it turns down from here, like I said before, if we get a penetration of this 15,000, that's going to be a sort of unprecedented situation. The only time we had something like that was 87 or uh, back here in 2008. Of course, that was a sort of world-shaking crisis. Uh, fortunately, because of the speed of how, how fast this has to happen, just like I said with the Bitcoin chart as well, we will know fairly quickly what's going to happen because it has to happen very fast. And we'll talk to you next time.